Well, hey, friends, welcome back to the teaching and preaching ministry of Mohican Church. I'm Pastor Paul Bartholomew. Great to have you with us today. We're continuing in our series uh, on The Ancients Were Commended. It's our series that we're looking at some of the great men and women of the faith. Today's message is simply entitled The Showdown. Now, if you're familiar with your Old Testament, um, there could be several things that come to mind, several different stories come to mind, uh, accounts, I guess I'd rather use the word accounts, several different accounts that might come to mind, but uh, the one that we're going to be taking a look at today comes out of 1 Kings chapter 18. That probably narrows it down for you a lot. We're talking about the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. So, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to begin in verse 16 here in just a moment. Before we do that, though, let's have a word of prayer. Father, it is good to be able to gather uh, this day once again, Lord, in your gracious presence. We thank you, Father, that, that we come this morning not on our own merit, well, whatever time of day it is, uh, as uh, folks are watching, Lord, we come not on our own merit. We, we come only through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that, uh, that you have given us this distinct privilege through Jesus to come boldly and with confidence before your throne. And uh, so, God, as we gather, well, Lord, we just pray that you would do your transforming work within us Lord, that as we read your word, uh, we know that it is living, we know that it is active, and we know, Father, that sometimes our hearts, our minds are dull, and uh, so, Father, we just pray that you would bring us to life in the hearing of your word, anoint our ears, Lord, as it is spoken, and now our, uh, anoint our ears, Lord, that we might hear, at our hearts, that we might comprehend, um, and Lord, anoint these lips, I pray, as I speak. Uh, God, that, that only you, Lord, only you would receive the glory as we see your hand at work yet in another individual that you uh, created, you gifted, you called out, and you used through Elijah the prophet. Uh, so, God, we thank you for that. Uh, we just pray your blessing on the time that we spend in your word through Jesus our Lord. Amen. So as I've been doing with each of these texts, it seems we're going back just to give you a little bit of a, a backstory before we jump into 1 Kings 18. And so in the 17th chapter, as chapter 17 opens up, Elijah the Tishbite had said to Ahab, and we'll get to Ahab in just a little bit, but Elijah uh, the Tishbite said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. That's actually referenced uh, then in the book of James. You may recall James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, reminding us of, well, I mean, you talk about faith, right? Uh, without faith, it's impossible to please God. As, uh, and that's exactly what the ancients were commended for. Well, in the book of James, James uh, recounts this and said, hey, listen, so Elijah was a man just like us, just like us. I'm always encouraged when I read that because it reminds me we're about to see in our, this message today, we're about to see Elijah used by God in an incredible way I love to hear that he was a man just like us, just like me. Well, the Bible goes on to say in James 5, uh, verse 17, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Now, with the exception of this week, it's been a pretty dry summer here in Ohio, but, but nothing like this, right? Right? No rain on the land for three and a half years after Elijah prayed earnestly. And then it says in verse 18, and again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. And so uh, that's just a reference there to, to this very thing when Elijah said to Ahab, 
As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Pretty powerful statement. Even more powerful God, right? So anyway, uh, so something else that's going to be helpful for us as we're opening up this text today. So who is Baal? Uh, who is uh, Baal? You may have heard it uh, pronounced that way. I'm just using Baal. It rolls off the tongue a little bit sooner. But so who is Baal? Uh, he's the Canaanite uh, Phoenician god of rain and fertility. Interestingly enough, so you're already, your wheels are turning right now, right? Um, so, so, the, so Israel, under King Ahab, Israel had, uh, they had just uh, begun, they had turned away from God, not completely, but uh, they had turned away from God, they had turned to, to other gods, they had turned to false gods like Baal, and, uh, and so you can already see where this is going, can't you? If, if Baal is the Phoenician, the, the Canaanite god of rain and fertility, when Elijah steps up and says, listen, I'm telling you, as the Lord, as sure as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word, well, that's going to fly right in the face of Baal, the god of rain and fertility. So, so, uh, so look with me. Chapter 18, verse 16. And I'm going to turn there too. And so, chapter 18, verse 16. So, Obadiah, and, and the start of chapter six, 18 actually gives us introduction to who is Obadiah? What was the conversation with Elijah? Uh, Elijah sends Obadiah to, hey, you, you go tell Ahab that I'm here. Well, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and he told him and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah said to him, he says, I haven't made trouble for Israel. But you and your father's family have, you have abandoned the Lord's commands and you have followed the Baals. And so just to pause for a few moments, unpack a little bit. Uh, so Ahab went to meet Elijah. So who is Ahab? Who is Ahab? Well, he becomes king of Israel. Ahab is described beginning in verse 30 of 1 Kings 16. Ahab is described this way. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Well, now hold on. So pause a moment. So if you were to look back at Omri, Ahab's dad, Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those who had come before him. So Ahab did not come from a great line. Uh, his dad sinned more than all those who came before him. And then Ahab takes power and sins more than all those who had come before him, including his father, who sinned more than all those who had preceded him. And so it gives us an idea who Ahab is. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, and you have to read about those, uh, not only considered it trivial to do that, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. And so that's who Ahab is. That's the guy who then looks at Elijah and says, hey, is that you, you troubler of Israel? Well, why? Well, because Elijah was the one through whom God spoke at the start of chapter 17 then uh, and said, hey, listen, there's not going to be rain nor dew over the next few years, except at my word, okay? Well, God was working through Elijah. It wasn't Elijah, but, uh, but Elijah, and 
excuse me, but Ahab, if you look there in verse 17, oh, you're the troubler of Israel. Oh, this is your fault, isn't it? It tells us something about our fallen nature, doesn't it? Our fallen nature, and I mean, we can see it in Genesis chapter 3. What do you recall happened when, when God spoke to Adam and said, hey, hold on, in the garden, right? Hey, uh, so hold on. So, so why are you hiding? Did you eat from the fruit from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? What did Adam say? Well, it was the woman that you gave me. She gave me some to eat and I ate it. And, and Eve said, ah, oh, but it was the serpent, right? I mean, we see it in the fallen nature of man. As early as mankind has existed, we see this fallen nature. It's handy to have somebody to blame and, and uh, you know, rather than the honorable thing would just be to step up and take responsibility. But Ahab instead says, oh, you troubler of Israel. So he's doing this blame shifting. We see the truth of the matter in chapter 18, verse 18. When he said, no, 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 I haven't made trouble. It's, it's you and your father's family. Now, Again, you can read up more on Ahab and his family. If you go back to chapter 16, beginning in verse 21 and following, you can see uh, the kind of family that Ahab came from. Let's continue reading verse 19. So now summon, uh, Elijah speaking to Ahab, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. Bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And so Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if, God, but if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people said nothing. Again, we'll pause here and just unpack this a little bit. You know, one of the things is, uh, one of the things that we notice at this point, so they've come to this crossroad, if you will, and Elijah looks at the people. Uh, we're talking about Israel here. We're talking about God's chosen. And they weren't a people who had totally rejected God, but what they had done was they had become contaminated by worship of Baal. They, they had become entangled in relationships with Baal followers. And uh, I tell you what, we talked last week about, you know, one more reason to not be unequally yoked. And we see that here as well. You know, the entanglements that, that took place. Um, and, and so... But they hadn't totally rejected God, but, you know, they had God plus a little something, someone else. Uh, may I just remind you, you know, there are those, uh, there are those today who think, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I believe in God, but I, I talked to a man, it's been a few years back, I talked to a man, though, who said, well, he said, you know, I, I just, I've studied all the religions, and I like to... to to skim the best from all of them. Let me tell you what God says. God, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who revealed himself to us, you know, the one true God who revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son. God says this in Exodus chapter 20, and, and I, we do not live under the law now. We live under grace. That's only because Christ was the fulfillment of the law, okay? But... So look at the law. God says, we learn much about his character and nature here. He says, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, God spoke all these words and said this, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Listen, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And, and so, uh, in case anyone listening to this message is like, well, no, you know what, I, I, I have a little bit of God, but I've got a little bit of Buddha, I've got a little bit of Allah, I've got a little bit of this and that and whatever, uh, you have to understand, God is a jealous God. He will not share the affection that is due him alone. He will not share that affection. That's what the people in Elijah's time were doing. They hadn't totally rejected God. They had just said, hey, God, move over. Uh, we need to make room for Baal here, right? Well, so all of Israel was summoned. All of Israel had to make a choice. When uh, in verse 21, you know, Elijah says, hey, listen, how long are you going to waver between these two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Now, you may think that's an interesting statement that Elijah makes. It's like, why in the world did he even give them a choice? Well, you know, we, we see several places in the scriptures where it seems, that, uh, it seems that a choice is given. It's in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, we're reminded that a house that's divided against itself cannot stand. Um, in James chapter 1, we're reminded that a double-minded man is unstable in all that he does. And so, so the need... Uh, it's just one of the basics of, of uh, the way that, uh, you know, in the design of life, that, that this duel, uh, this, this divided, that's going to end, that's going to end in destruction, right? It's, it's uh, I mean, consider the, the house that was built on the sand versus the house built on the rock. I mean, if you, if you were to build part of your house on a good solid footing, and, and, and the other half of your house, on uh, just, just put it out there on the dirt. It might look beautiful for a little bit, but guess what's going to happen in time? That's because that double-minded man, if you will, unstable, unstable foundation. And, and Elijah knew that. He was speaking the words of God to the people of God, but helping them understand, he's like, hold on, you have got to choose. What you're doing right now is a fool's game. There's one true God, and you're trying to mix him up like many people do today. Well, I, you know what? I, I believe in Jesus plus good works. I believe in Jesus plus. And it's like, no, hold on. Hold on. Elijah is pointing out to the people, it's like, look, you got to choose. Because you may think, because you've got a little bit of God in your corner, that you're doing just fine. And Elijah wants them to be very clear that it's like you are going to crash and burn. Jesus spoke uh, about the importance of, of one or the other in Revelation chapter 3, right? When, when Jesus spoke to the church of Laodicea. And he spoke about this lukewarmness. He said, you know what? I wish you were hot or cold. As it is, I want to spit you out of my mouth. You're gross. You're disgusting. Okay? And so, all of Israel was summoned. All of Israel had to make a choice. And still today, a choice must be made. Who do you choose? Who do you choose? Well, we're going to see what happens here. Verse 22 so the people said nothing when they, they heard Elijah's challenge. And so he said to them, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. And so get two bulls for us. Get two bulls, not B-O-W-L-S, in case you don't have the text in front of you, but bulls, B-U-L-L-S. Get two, let them choose one for themselves. And let them cut it into pieces, put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And then I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And, and then you call on the name of the Lord or of your God. I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. I just can't help but think as I'm reading this, as we pause there at the end of 24, 
well, the people said that, okay, this is good. I can't help but think, you know, you drive around like I drive around, you see those bumper stickers that, uh, that the world would love it. And now hold on, Satan would love it if we would just get one of those bumper stickers that puts all these religions on an, on an even field, right? That just, uh, that just lines them up and, and here you go. And they, they, they say coexist. You know, they use the symbols of the various religions of the world and coexist, or I've seen some that, that use, uh, that, that uh, it actually spells out tolerance as they are, uh, as they are you know, using the symbols representing the various, uh, the various religions of the world. I, I love that Elijah here, he's like, no, listen, here's what it is. You call on the name of your God, I'm going to call on the name of the Lord, of Yahweh, all right, of Jehovah God. I'm going to, going to call on him. I love it that, that Elijah is not even, he is so not politically correct here. He is just so matter of fact, there is one true God, you're not serving him, and you need to know that. Um, oh, that we would not today so quickly acquiesce to to, uh, to, the, to the musings of the world about the religions. Oh, that we would boldly stand up and say, no, listen, I respect your right to believe what you believe. I do respect your right, but I don't believe for a moment that the God that you serve, if it's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if he is not the God who revealed himself per, uh, perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ, then, you know, I respect your right to believe that. I do not believe that you are worshiping God, no matter what you call him, no matter what religion uh, props up this God of yours, if it is not the God who revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ, the God who is pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Christ, then, then that's not God. And I, that's not the one true God. And I I wish we would have today the courage to be that, to live that way. We're, we're, we're condemned as arrogant. Uh, we're condemned as boastful. You think Elijah didn't take some heat here? Outnumbered 850 to 1. You think he didn't take some heat here for saying, no, listen, there is one God. You call on your God I'm going to call on the name of Jehovah, okay? So every single advantage, though, you notice in verses 22 to 24, every single advantage was given over to them. Hey, listen, you get to pick first, so Elijah has no tricks up his sleeve. You choose the bowl that you want. Does one of those two bowls look more flammable? I don't know. Pick that bowl. Uh, you cut it up. You cut it into pieces, you know, rather than big chunks. Maybe smaller pieces are going to burn faster. Um, you put it on the wood that you have selected. On an altar that you have, that you have set up. You take all the advantages. And, and then they even got to go first, right? So you look down in 25, so Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bowls and prepare it first since there are so many of you and, and call on the name of your God, but do not light it on fire. And so they took the bowl given them and prepared it and then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response, no one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and has to be awakened. Shout louder. And so they shouted louder. And then they slashed themselves with swords and with spears, as was their custom. You know, just to pause for a second, it says, until their blood flowed. I, I so praise God. We serve a God who so loved us that he was like, you know what, your own bloodshed isn't going to save you. 
you need the blood shed, for without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness, but, but your own bloodshed isn't going to do a thing. You know, it was, it was something that was done to, uh, by the, the worshipers of Baal. It was something that was done to elicit pity from Baal, uh, to demonstrate their devotion to Baal. I'm, I'm grateful that it's only the blood of Christ who is going to catch the attention, if you will, of Jehovah God. Only the blood of Christ. And so, anyway, but that's what was going on. And so midday passed, they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But verse 29 says there was no response, no one answered, and no one paid attention. That's it. That's it. From the, from, I don't mean that's the end of the sermon, so don't get up yet. <laughs> Please. Please. But, but I mean, that's it. That's the response that they get from this mighty Baal. Uh, for whom they would shed their own blood readily. Um, you know, this, this God who was promised to be the God of rain and fertility and nothing is happening. Not a thing is happening as the people cry out to him. And so then let's continue verse 30. Oh, and by the way, I know probably you're listening and say, well, of course not, because there was no one there. You're absolutely correct. That's why, that's why no, there was no response and no one answered and no one paid attention. Guys, because there is one true God, all right? So then Elijah said to the people, verse 30 through 35, Elijah said to the people, hey, come here to me. And they came to him and, and he repaired an al the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. And he took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two sayas of seed. Uh, so maybe about 13 quarts of seed. All right, so that's how big the trench is around it. He arranged the wood. He cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, now fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Now, even a child in this room, even the youngest boy who's ever played with matches uh, knows that if you want to see a fire burn well, you start with dry wood and you try to keep water away. Uh, Four large jars with water, poured on the offering and poured on the wood. What was he doing? He wanted there to be no mistake. Hey, listen, no tricks here. I'm just showing you guys the power of the one true God, right? So, so fill four large jars with water, pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again then, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. Now the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. Well, so one of the things that I love, um, and I'm sure you noticed it, but one of the things that I absolutely love in Elijah's response here, what do we see here in his, in, in his actions that was different from the actions of the, the Baal worshipers? Well, I mean, we see everything that's been missing in Israel as when you take a look in verses 30 through 35, you see the first thing that he did. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which shows this deep reverence for a holy God. Has, has your reverence for a holy God begun to slip? Because guys, I mean, we can, uh, friends, brothers, sisters, we can... We can look at, at what Israel had sunken into. It's like, how in the world did they ever get there? I would submit to you that this is one of the first ways their, their view of God uh, began to be cheapened. Their understanding of who God was. Very first thing that Elijah did was he repaired the altar of the Lord, which lay in ruins. A deep reverence for a holy God. And then he took these 12 stones. Uh, 12 stones. Uh, one representing each of the 12 tribes of Israel. It represented 
God's uh, faithfulness. It represented the covenant. It represented this, hey, guys, remember who you are and whose you are. And I can't help but think that, uh, that, that this was, uh, was another reminder as they see him drawing stones. This generation no doubt heard the stories of Joshua and recall the, the 12 stones of remembrance that they pulled up out of the middle of the Jordan as they were entering Canaan. Can't help but think that, that those 12 stones, I mean, it, it had deep meaning to Elijah, but it had to have been getting the attention of the people of Israel. And, and so uh, everything that was missing in Israel, the deep reverence for God, the, the remembrance of, of who they were and whose they are, the covenant, the faithfulness of God. He built this, then it says, in the name of the Lord. Now, that's not tacking on this little uh, magic phrase as if, you know, sometimes we think that if we just say, you know, in Jesus' name at the end of the prayer, then it's like we have found the secret code that if we just say these magic words, then God has to do whatever we say. Uh, wrong answer. Wrong answer. When we pray in Jesus' name, that's, that's in keeping with the character and the nature of Jesus Christ. When Elijah was building, building this in the name of the Lord, uh, something that had been missing from Israel, is, is back on the table. Elijah brings it back, building this altar in keeping with the character and nature of Jehovah God, right? And so all about it is to bring glory to him. And then finally, what do we see here that, that we were not seeing in, in Israel? A genuine faith in God. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, look at all, he gave himself every disadvantage. Remember how he gave the, the Baal worshipers, the false prophets, he gave them every advantage? He gave himself every disadvantage. That there be no mistake that there is a God in Israel. Verses 36 and 37. So at the time of the evening sacrifice, prophet Elijah stepped forward and he prayed, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. And so the, the prayer of Elijah was, was relatively simple. It was clearly effective, but it was a simple prayer. As is, by the way, I, I, I talked with someone just recently that, that wanted some help understanding how to pray and concerned that, that uh, their prayer wasn't, wasn't that, it, that it didn't sound good, that it wasn't constructed well. And it's like, no, listen, what God wants is, is your heart. The, the prayer coming clearly from the heart of Elijah, of Elijah was this. He clearly addressed the one true God, uh, nothing generic about it, right? I was in a pastor's meeting a long time ago where the reference, uh, the suggestion was made that, well, you know, there are going to be people there who don't worship Jesus, so we'll just pray generically. That's nonsense. There, We do not serve a generic God. Elijah wanted to make sure that uh, he is addressing the one true God. O oh Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Jacob, right? God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's like, so, so, so there is no question who he is addressing. By the way, I love his boldness because he's still facing odds that are 850 to 1. But you know, don't you, that you and God are a majority every time. But, but, looking around... 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah. He is the one who is standing up for the one true God. Anyway, uh, but and he clearly addressed that one true God. Make no mistake who I'm talking to. Uh, make no mistake that the glory belongs to him alone. Elijah was so clear about that. God, I want you alone to get the glory and 
check it out, praying for the hearts of the people. God, I'm so looking to see, I'm, I'm so anxious to see hearts turning back to you. Well, so when he finished praying, verse 38, then, remember that, that the one who answered by fire, he is God. Verse 38 says, so then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice. It burned up the wood. It burned up the stones and burned up the soil, licked up the water in the trench. I mean, can you just imagine being on that mountain at that time? Uh, how far back would you have to stand to feel safe at such a moment like that? You've got this one, you have this one aging prophet there who is calling out to God. You've got the grandstands, if you will, filled with the prophets of Asherah and the prophets of Baal. And you've got this one guy calling out to God around this altar. Now they had just seen an altar probably fashioned similarly to Baal. Nothing happened. No need to stand back. But I mean, check this out. The fire of the Lord fell, burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. Well, the people saw this and felt prostrate, and they cried out, The Lord, He is God! The Lord, He is God! And they falling prostrate and crying out, to God sounds about right. Wow, so, so what happened then, by the way? Because this was a showdown. Uh, you know, this was a showdown, if you will. Verse 40, so Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let any of them get away. And they seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. And so you see this judgment on all these false prophets. Uh, we see the, the judgment of God on all these false prophets. And, and then, and then, rain, which amongst other things was confirming Elijah as a true prophet of God. The false prophets, by the way, there was, uh, you know, the things that they prophesied. There are kinds of people today who call themselves prophets, right? Have the gift of, uh, of prophet. There's so many people uh, we'll claim that today, and, and nobody seems to be paying attention to the fact that, you know, I mean, these guys prophesy this and prophesy that and prophesy this other thing that never, ever comes true, but they're still regarded by those who want to believe in this prophet amongst them as, oh, no, they're the real deal. No, I'm telling you all, this is how you know the real deal. Elijah stood up. Uh, Elijah had declared that there is one true God, that there is judgment coming um, on, on the, the false prophets and prophesied that there would be rain at his word. Well, guess what? So there was the judgment on the false prophets, but then there is this rain confirming him to be a true prophet of God. So verse 41, Elijah says, hey, uh, Ahab, Go eat and drink, for there is a sound of heavy rain. Now, what comes next? I just love this. I just love this. So you got to pay attention because we might be thinking, oh, there you go. You know, the showdown on Mount Carmel, that was really cool. Loved how that worked out. That's pretty exciting. Isn't God awesome? And I would agree with all of that. But check out how this chapter ends so Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, put his face between his knees, and he told his servant, hey, you go look toward the sea. And, and the servant went and looked. There's nothing there, the servant says. And so Elijah said, go back. Now, he didn't just say go back one time. He said, go look again. Seven times, right? And the seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising up from the sea. And so Elijah said, well, you better go tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Which, now think about it, for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And so probably all of his wet weather gear was put away, I would imagine. Y'all like, I mean, some of our friends just this past week, uh, with all of the dryness, a lot of uh, wet weather stuff has just been put away. It's like, well, whatever, we don't need it. Imagine three and a half years. It's 
Especially for all those people that say, if you haven't used it in a, in a year, throw it out. Well, <laughs> three and a half years, no rain. He says, you go tell Ahab, you better hitch up your chariot and get down there before the rain stops you. And meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose, a heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon him, uh, came upon Elijah, excuse me, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Uh, just such an incredible, uh, just such an incredible reminder of the power of our great God. And, and I would just remind you again that, that in James chapter 5, when it says Elijah was a man just like us, but he had faith in our great God. Hebrews 11, I, I referenced it earlier, but Hebrews 11, I would simply leave you with this. Friends, faith is being sure of what we hope for and, and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. Guys, I know it is so difficult uh, sometimes to be so hope-filled when, um, when we're outnumbered, um, when we've been in a long dry spell, it is so difficult to be hope-filled. I, I pray that this reminder today would strengthen and encourage you and wherever there is discouragement, that once again, your heart would be filled with the hope all because of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word, your living, active word once again. God, I thank you for the opportunity to open it and break it forth with these, uh, my dear friends. And, and Father, we just pray uh, now indeed take this truth, plant it deep in us. Uh, God, may it leave us in awe and wonder of you and you alone, not, not wowed by Elijah, because he was just like us, but God, you are great and mighty and awesome. Nothing is too hard for you. And so thank you, God. Fill our hearts with faith, we pray. Increase our faith, we pray. And be glorified in us, be glorified through us, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, well, thank you so much uh, for tuning in today. Looking forward to seeing you, uh, well, to being seen, perhaps, next week. I would love it though if you would uh, if you would be able to come and worship with us in person. Absolutely love that. But in the meantime, sure glad that you can join us here. Thank you so much. God bless.